already know me or don't know me, I work in creative services under the marketing department. My official title is uh, video producer. And I make the videos for our, com our programs. And um, today, today I'm gonna try and tell you how to not just tell a story in the sense of you're gonna leave here and go write the novel you've always wanted to write, but I hope that what I teach you will help you communicate more effectively. This means whether you're sending an email, writing an advertisement, sending a tweet, no matter what it is, how do you effectively get your point across or what you're trying to say to the other person? Um, the other secret thing that I'm trying to do is I have a little side project called the Creative Break. And I hope to maybe in, uh, inspire you to participate in not the next one because I've already booked it and I'll tell you about this later, uh, but in the future ones. Uh, and I'll talk more about that at the end of this presentation if we have enough time. So storytelling, messaging is gonna be the common thing that I'm gonna refer to and what we're going to be helping you do better, communicating. Uh, the good news is, is that um, you already have what it takes to make the first step, which is you have taste. Um, what that means is you know a good story when you hear it, not the kind of taste that lets you crave or savor curry and hate you know, caviar. Uh, but congratulations, you had the first step. Let's get that out of the way. You know a good story when you hear it. Uh, you watch a TV show and know immediately that it's rubbish. That's what I'm talking about here. So why do you have taste already? Well, why is it already part of you? It's part of your DNA because when your ancestors were in caves, they were using stories to transfer information from one generation to the next, where the, you know, to harvest uh, the crops, where to find food, where to find shelter. This information was passed through stories, and it's why you know a good story when you hear one. Um, in fact, story is so compelling, it's one of the earliest uses to teach everyone a lesson. Aesop's Fables, uh, you're familiar with some of them, The Ant and the Grasshopper, The Boy Who Cried Wolf. Uh, the Boy Who Cried Wolf, I'm sure everybody knows about it, but essentially is a story about a young boy who decides to trick the villagers and the sheep herders into thinking a wolf is about to attack and does this over and over. And then by the time that the, um, the wolf is actually coming, the, uh, the sheep herders are like, whatever, and as you know, consequences are taken on both parts. So the thing that's interesting about this is, what is the name of the, what's the boy's name? What's the town? Where is this located? Why, you know, why didn't Aesop tell us this? He didn't tell it because it doesn't matter. Uh, the part of the story that matters is getting the point across that the boy who cried wolf is basically saying, don't lie. And it stays in our brain because uh, stories act like a flight simulator. If you're not, you know, flight simulator, everybody knows what that is, right? Um, your brain is going through the simulations of a story and feeling the experience of that happening. Uh, that's why Aesop didn't just make a bullet point list called Aesop's Tips for Life. Don't lie. You know, pack for your food for the winter. Uh, don't take candy from strangers. Um, stop me if you've heard this one, but someone that you know that knows someone else from another town knew of a boy or girl who ate candy on Halloween and died as a result of it because it was either tampered with uh, drugs or had razor blades in the candy apples, right? Well, here's the thing, it never happened. It just, at least it didn't happen in the way that you think it happened. So, who ruined Halloween? <laughs> no. Halloween, uh, that story is told over and over. Last Halloween, I was actually watching the news and saw someone talk about this happening, and I'm like, it's not true. Uh, and so some sociologists felt this was true in the early 90s. And what they did is they went through the newspapers from 1959 to 1984 and looked for any reports on uh, tampered drugs during Halloween and all those incidences. Here's what they found out. 
of all of those instances, there were 76 that reported tampered drugs or tampered candy uh, around Halloween. Of those 76, only 20 of them reported injury. Of those 20 that reported injury, only two of them resulted in death. So you're probably thinking, ah, so it does happen, it's true. Well, unfortunately, the story goes like this. One of the deaths was a five-year-old who found his uncle's heroin stash and died because of it. And the family tried to cover it up by sprinkling the heroin in his candy. Uh, the other one was a father who was looking to set, you know, claim an insurance uh, settlement by poisoning his son's candy with cyanide. So the moral of this story is taking candy from strangers, totally cool. It's your family you have to worry about. <laughs> uh, but the other moral is this stories are so powerful that they can make you believe something that is totally false be true. Uh, people use it in politics, they use it in marketing, they use it in every facet. And if you know how this works, you can communicate so effectively that you'll amaze yourself. So um, why is it that we're so gullible? Well, we're so gullible because first off, it's a story. We can imagine it happening, flight simulator. Um, it's credible. You know somebody, you're only a few degrees of separation, supposedly, from the victim. Um, the other reason is it's unexpected. Um, no matter how horrible of a world we live in, it's our human nature to believe that everyone is inherently good. So why would anybody you know, try to poison children that's messed up? Uh, the parts of the story are also simple, they're concrete. Uh, because you don't know the where it takes place or what the boy's name is, it's simple. Uh, because it's simple, it's concrete, you can imagine everything um, happening in that Halloween story. You can imagine the uh, candy, you can imagine the drugs and the evil stranger, you can imagine the sad parents. And because you can imagine all that, it's highly emotional. Um, and that's exactly why we're so gullible to a story like that, or why a really great story resonates with us. Uh, Jonathan the other day said he could explain his life through uh, The Simpsons or Star Wars, and it's because those stories have elements that are, you know, can relate to so many other things. But the bad news is, is that just because you have taste isn't enough. Um, unfortunately, when you're trying to tell a story, taste doesn't help you. The reason why is because uh, something called the uh, curse of knowledge. Now, the curse of knowledge is basically the ultimate villain in this story. Um, in fact, the Curse of Knowledge, if this was an epic novel, say Harry Potter, the Curse of Knowledge would be Voldemort. And to give you an example of how this works, I'm going to try and pick somebody. Paj, what is your favorite childhood memory in five seconds? What's happening here is, I don't know Haj's childhood, but he does. And right now, all the memories of his childhood are resurfacing in his head, and they're all competing for the title of favorite childhood memory. And that is a curse. And that's what keeps you from communicating effectively, whether you're writing a novel, an email, a tweet, a text message, you're just bottled up. Uh, the good news is, I'm going to teach you how to overcome the curse of knowledge. Um, and I'm going to do it with a checklist. Checklists are good, uh, unless they're the kind where someone's seeking revenge and your name is on that list. <laughs> but this is a good list, a really good list, I promise. And good news is, is there's only six pieces to it. And even better news is you don't always have to check off all six items. The goal is to check off as many as possible. Uh, the first one is to try and be as simple as possible. The other one is to try and be unexpected. Um, after unexpected, you want to try and be, you know, you want to be uh, concrete as possible. There's concrete and there's abstract. And then you definitely want to find some sort of credibility. Why is someone going to believe me? 
emotional helps, and I'm going to show you why emotional helps. And last but not least, it has to be a story. So, simple. What does it mean to be simple? To be simple means to find the core of your message, what matters. Just like in The Boy Who Cried Wolf, you have the boy, the wolf, the sheep herders. Simple. You can hear that story and then a month later retell that story verbatim because the details don't matter. Um, to help you find your core, um, anybody here ever been in the military? No? Okay. Just want to make sure I'm not preaching to the choir. In the military, they have something called commander's intent. Now, you can imagine if there's like the plan to capture Osama bin Laden. They had all these plans, and they could you know, say, all right, you're going to go through that door, and then you're going to do this. But it doesn't matter how awesome of your plan is, you can't predict what's going to happen. In fact, some of that did happen in the taking of Osama bin Laden. There was the a helicopter that went down. A bunch of things didn't go to plan. That's why commander's intent is so important because commander's intent, it, it doesn't matter what the mission is. As long as the main task has been, you know, tackled for the taking Osama bin Laden, it was get Osama bin Laden. Here's the plan, but if, if the shit hits the fan, of, excuse my French, supposedly, uh, there's still, you know, you still know what you need to do. You can change the plan. It gives you improvisation. In fact, it gives you improvisation because that wolf, uh, the boy who cried wolf, it doesn't matter if it's a boy. It could have been a girl. Maybe, you know, maybe the wolf is a bear. A way to um, also make things simple is a thing called schemas. For people writing notes, it'll be spelled later. Um, and a way to really teach you how schemas work are this exercise. You're a time traveler, right? You got this awesome DeLorean, and you're gonna go back to 1850. Explain the internet to someone there. You've arrived, you walk up to someone and you say, in the future there's this thing called the internet. What words, seriously, start shouting out words at me, would you use to explain the internet to someone? Information. Cloud. Cloud? Okay. Uh, some more. Come on. Magic. Magic. Knowledge. Knowledge. We get electricity. Somewhere. Electricity. Different way of communication. Different way of communication. You're getting there. Long distance communication. Encyclopedia. There's a good segue into how you would do this. Do you have another one? Okay. <laughs> so if you were there, you would need to find out what does this person know already? Well, you could tell them there's a theater and everybody gets to participate and put up like their own performances, YouTube. Um, you could talk to people about their being mail, communication, telegraphs. Um, you could use all those words to explain how we communicate with everyone there. Books, libraries, information. You know, it's all at your fingertips. And you can also talk about there being a forum. Everybody gets together and shares ideas. And these are schemas. Uh, what they do is they are things that your audience or the people you're telling your story or your message to that they already know and understand. And it's a way to then bridge it down to what you're trying to explain to them. Another concrete example is, I'm from Louisiana for the people who don't know. I'm always talking about crawfish, probably the best food in the world. And to a lot of people, they're like, what's a crawfish? Well, I have an easy device I've always used. I always ask people, well, have you heard of a lobster? And when they say, yeah, I heard of a lobster, I'm like, all right, well, a lobster is a mini crawfish schema. So the next thing on our agenda is to explain unexpected. Um, when you're trying to explain things that are unexpected, uh, easiest thing is to disrupt a pattern. The reason you're probably going to remember that for quite a while is I totally disrupt your belief and understanding of that story by telling you it's totally not true and showing you the facts. Um, and the easiest way to get someone to listen and remember something or even take action is to break a pattern. Nora Ephron, we all, most of the world, uh, mourned her loss very recently. 
She was a screenwriter for When Harry Met <coughs> Sally and um, Sleepless in Seattle. A lot of people don't know that before she was a screenwriter, she was an established journalist. And in a few interviews, she always talked about this diversion in her destiny. And she always blames the fact that she went into journalism on her high school journalism teacher. Because she walked in thinking, a journalist. Oh, they obtain facts by asking who, what, when, where, and why. And they report on those facts. Well, on the first day of this class, in one lesson, this teacher totally disrupted that. What he did is he said, all right, class, here's your um, first assignment. Take these facts, which is uh, Kenneth Peters, the principal of the high school in Beverly Hills, announced today that all of the faculty was going to go to Sacramento to learn about new teaching methods. Among the speakers are all these like high up people. So taking her knowledge of a journalist gets the facts and then reports on those facts she admitted that the whole class, including herself, basically created a lead that was just rearranging the facts and came up with something like Governor Pat Brown, Margaret Mead, and Robert you know, Hutchins, they will address the high school faculty on Thursday, blah, 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 blah. The teacher, as everybody, turned in their assignments, which they typed on typewriters, if anybody knows those still, uh, turned them in, and he's looking at all of them going, uh-huh. Uh -huh. And finally, before even finishing the stack, puts the uh, assignments down, stands up in front of the class and says, the lead to this story is, there will be no school next Thursday. <laughs> Nora Ephron said that it was a breathtaking moment. She had believed that being a journalist was re uh, regurgitating the facts. But what she realized in that one moment was that a journalist figures out the point. And from then on, she was completely obsessed. There are two lessons in this story. The first one is, how do you, you be unexpected? You do it by disrupting the pattern. But the lesson within the lesson is that you really will need to figure out what matters to your audience. Why should they care? When you come to the next piece, which is to be concrete, I told you that the point of the boy who cried wolf was don't lie, right? But sometimes, giving a play-by-play, -play, a story of how the boy tricked the uh, sheep herders over and over, um, you need to be concrete. And given that play-by-play -play doesn't always work. So I have an example on how to like really feel this out. And if you are an avid football fan and I ask a question after, wait to answer. <laughs> Breeding standing back around the 35 and Tyron Matthew standing at the LSU 10. There is the snap, there's the kick, an end over ender, and Matthew's going to take it in, a chance to run. Near side 10, 15, he's at the 20, still in speed, 25, 30, 35, he's got a chance, needs a block, he's in midfield, he's going to take it to the house, 30, 25, 15, 10, 5, see ya, 91 yards. All right, for the non football fans, what happened? Touchdown? Yeah. Touchdown, touchdown, but how did he get a touchdown? How did, what was the first thing that happened? Intercepted? Intercepted. Oh, were they punching the ball or like they the ball? That's the first part. It was a kickoff return. And whose house was he taking it to? His mom's, his aunt's, right? Taking it to the house. I mean, it, it could be used in so many sense, but it's an idiom. Ask anybody from our centers, and they'll just look at you with a blank face, taking it to whose house? Because it's an idiot. <laughs> and that's because sometimes this whole play-by-play -play idea doesn't work. And that's why it's really important to understand what I mean by concrete. Concrete means to find a common language, to find the things that, just like schemas, you're going to find something that relates to this person, so you're speaking to them on their level. And it doesn't mean dumb down. It means to just find that common thread to then give your uh, message. And it's easy to think about this when you think of how Velcro memory works. Everybody knows how Velcro works, yes? Yeah. You have the loops, which the hooks then go into the loops, and that's what keeps it staying together. It's really helpful to think of how to be concrete when you think of the loops as what your audience knows 
and the hooks as where you want to aim your message. Because when this hooks into there, it's going to stick. They're going to get it. They're going to understand. They're going to be able to move on to the next thing. To get you to understand what this hook feels like when it's used properly. I want you to remember a few things. And I want you to clear your head. Think of these things as I say them. Remember the capital of Kansas. Remember the first line of Hey Jude. Remember the Mona Lisa. Remember the house that you grew up in. Remember the definition of truth. And now remember the definition of watermelon. So what this is, is an illustration and how memory works, how you recall memory. And that's exactly what the loops are that you're trying to aim for with your hooks. Unless you grew up in Topeka, Kansas, the capital of Kansas is completely abstract. Now, if you contrast that to the first line of Hey Jude, what happened was you heard Paul McCartney's voice in your head. Uh, you probably even heard the first chords on the piano. Now, if you didn't, this weekend, please go buy a Beatles album. <laughs> now, credible. If you're familiar with a celebrity endorsement, Michael Jordan, Wheaties, Jennifer Aniston, and Vitamin Water, you get the gist of credibility. People see that Michael Jordan is eating Wheaties or Jennifer Aniston is drinking Vitamin Water, and they're like, I want to be like them. But sometimes it's not that easy. Let's take a trip back to 1979. In 1979, people, this includes scientists, the whole world believed that stomach ulcers, which if you've experienced one, you're probably remembering the pain now, uh, were caused by bad food, alcohol, or stomach acid. Well, two pathologists discovered that it was actually these spiral bacteria that were really causing this disease that affected 10% of the world. Problem is, the person who um, discovered this, his name was Robin Warren. And Robin Warren lived in Perth, Australia. And to make matters worse, <laughs> his colleague that found it with him, that's credited with the finding, named Barry Marshall, was an intern. To give you a sense of why the discovery coming out of Perth matters, that happening there is like celebrity gossip coming from Anchorage, Alaska. Um, it just doesn't happen. It's incredible. So without any ability to find some credibility, what did they do? Well, they did what any one of you would do. The intern, Barry Marshall, um, he downed a vial of this bacteria. And um, <laughs> within days, he started to experience all the classic symptoms of stomach ulcers. So he you know, channeled his inner Houdini and took antibiotics. And within days, all of the stomach ulcers were completely eradicated and gone. So you can notice that the scientists just didn't believe him until this point, because in 2005, the um, Warren and Marshall won the Nobel Prize for medicine. But you don't always have to go to extremes to get credibility. In fact, the first way to do it is to borrow credibility. Uh, it's something called a Sinatra test. Uh, if you're familiar with his song, New York, New York, there's a line in it that says that if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. It's the same principle. If it happened in one place, it can happen in another. If it failed in one place, it could fail in another. So you can use the credibility from the first instance to back up why you're going to do this in the first. It's the root of every business plan. Um, in the film industry, we call it the suspension of disbelief. Uh, what this means is that you can't have a cartoon that is running away from someone, flattens himself, and then goes under the door to come up the other side and get away. And then a few minutes later, gets to another door and can't open a dang thing. You're going to lose all credibility and have people walking out of the theater. Um, it's the same idea. If it happens in one place, it has to happen in another. Or if it doesn't, 
it has to happen, it has to not happen again. The other way to do it is to create credibility. This is called the human scale principle. To give you an example of how this works, this teacher in Tennessee was teaching her students about the Holocaust. And in the middle of it, one of our students raised her hand to say, how much, what does six million look like? And you can imagine how dumbfounded the teacher felt because, I mean, can, do you know what a million looks like? Heck, I can't even count the correct amount of beans in a jar at a, uh, you know, a state fair. So she had this awesome idea of how to um, bring that number down to something they could understand and ask them, start collecting paper clips um, and ask to collect until they got the six million. Well, instantly this idea was so great that it spread around the world. Governments, companies, people from all over the world started sending in paper clips to aid this effort because it was such a great idea. So in 2001, they ended up collecting 11 million paper clips. And today you can actually go to that school and in a German rail car that was donated by the German government, it is a monument and that holds all of those uh, the paper clips. And the reason why this worked was because six million, is, even though it's a defined number, it's abstract. So in order to be able to make it credible, she had to make it concrete. So you see how they all kind of work together and help each other out. The next thing is emotional. So emotional doesn't mean tear jerkers or being melodramatic or you know button pushing and getting people to react. It means to make people care. Uh, to if you make them feel, you make them care. If you make them care, they'll listen to you. It, this can be really complicated. You're trying to tap at emotions. There's all kinds. You, in marketing, we constantly think of, oh, we should do this. And then we realize, well, wait, it might cause this other reaction. So the easiest way to find the emotion in your story or your message is to think of this quote from Mother Teresa. She said that if I look at one, I'll act. If I look at the mass, I will not. What she means here is that it's easier to focus when it's an individual, it's one thing. Um, the person who did this most recently, some people might have seen the story, it really touched me, was a teacher in Minnesota. What he noticed was that he was a US history teacher, and he noticed that his students cared way more about March Madness than they did about US history. And so he's like, well, I need to fix this. Like, I need to be able to turn this around and make it the other way. So what he did is, is he created his own curriculum called Teach With Tournaments. So what he did is he brought U.S. history down to an individual versus trying to memorize all the events and all the history. Uh, what he did was took a bracket system just like the March Madness, and he then allowed students to choose a historical figure. Um, anybody was on the table, anybody from a military hero to a civil rights leader. And what he did is you, the students would stand up in front of the class and they would give this presentation on why this person deserved to win the match. And the students would vote on who won. So one of the instances of this tournament, the two students pitted their arguments against one another. They had to um, make an argument. Well, what happened was, was that Zapparini ended up winning. Well, the boy that was, had picked Audie Murphy was devastated. He started to cry. What he did is he actually ended up making another rebuttal on why his person should have won. And he told the story of Audie Murphy as a young boy. His father left the family and disappeared. And as a young boy, he had to grow up at a young age and take care of his five or six siblings and his mother. Well, what happened was, was the boy who chose Audie Murphy his father was uh, losing a battle with cancer. And what he noticed was that Audie Murphy was who, uh, was who he was gonna be without a father, um, having to take care of his two sisters and his mother and growing up really fast. And so what the success of the tournament or the Teach With Tournaments curriculum did was it followed up Mother Teresa's idea of when you focus on one, it's always gonna be greater than focusing on the mass. 
And what this teacher did was pre uh, prepare these students for something way bigger than an exam, something they were gonna remember their entire life. So when it comes to emotions, you don't have to be very elaborate. In fact, it could be really short. Uh, Jan, uh, John Cables in 1925 came up with probably the most famous sentence in advertising until it got milk. But uh, <laughs> he wrote for the US uh, School of Music uh, in New York, they laughed when I sat at the piano, but when I started to play. So in 15 words, that's 58 characters for you uh, Twitter folk, he conveyed the classic underdog, underdog story, which everybody knows, you're used to it, it's something that's effective and extremely emotional. It's the reason Rocky won Best Picture. Remember, stories are effective because they're mental training. They're mental training because they're basically a flight simulator. One of the other things that stories are really great at, and one of the reasons I wanna start this creative break is that stories don't always have to have a direct line to a solution or something that you're trying to figure out. Stories can actually be a springboard or illustrate one situation but inspire another. Uh, to give you an example, here's one. Solve this problem. You're a doctor faced with a patient who has a tumor in his stomach. Uh, unfortunately, you can't cut them open and operate, but unless you actually get rid of this tumor, your patient is gonna die. Now, good news is, is there's this new laser ray technology that if you aim it at the tumor, it will kill it. Unfortunately, at the intensity that you need to point that laser at the tumor and kill it, it kills all the healthy tissue around it. So without cutting this person open and using the ray machine, how do you solve uh, kill, uh, killing the tumor? without killing the healthy uh, tissue. Any takers? Well, it's okay, you don't have to feel bad. Uh, the study that this was designed for, 97% uh, of the subjects didn't know the answer. Uh, so what the uh, scientists ended up doing was saying, yeah, don't, don't worry about it, go take lunch. They came back from lunch and said, oh, read this story. So they read a story about a fortress that was based at the center of a uh, country and there were all these roads going towards uh, the, uh, the fortress. This general wanted to capture the fortress with his army, but unfortunately the roads were narrow and he probably would have lost most of his army to landmines and so forth. And so he was like, well, what I can do is I need the whole army to capture the fortress. So what I'll do is I'll break up the army and put them at separate, uh, separate roads. They'll convene at the fortress and take over the fortress and win the battle. What are you guys thinking about right now? Come on. Right. You thinking about the tumor? What about the tumor? Exactly. If you're lost or I lost you, it's my fault. But the basic thing that people understood is 70% of the people that read this story after lunch all of a sudden were able to solve that problem by taking the ray at different angles at the same time at lower uh, intensities, so that way when it met at the tumor, it was at the intensity to kill it, but not harm the healthy tissue. So as you can see, stories basically will inspire you to do something, <coughs> even if it's totally irrelevant. And it's easy to remember that if you go through this checklist, that simpler makes it easier to understand. That's the whole point of simple. When you break a pattern, everything is unexpected. If you just totally will be mind blowing and totally paying attention to what comes next. A common language is concrete. When you find something that explains that football field to someone or that football play to someone who doesn't, you know, know football, they'll understand it. But you gotta find that in order to be concrete. Uh, credibility can be borrowed or created. And it's easier to be emotional if you focus on one, one person, one thing, just narrow your focus. And I've said this a thousand times, but stories are flight simulators. So you will remember that these six things, they don't always have to be checked off. 
Uh, you can only get a few of them, and you still have a stronger story than when you only have one. And um, when you when you try to get as many as possible, you'll write. You know, you'll be better at writing a novel, an advertisement, uh, a tweet, or an email. So that's essentially all of the pieces of what makes a compelling story that I think that if you take this to heart, you'll write everything better. You'll think about communicating better. And I really hope with this idea that I'm going to do, uh, Jonathan is one of the presenters for the now planned, i got to find a date sometime in August, creative break. Um, it's going to be like a magazine slash TED Talk thing. Everybody knows what TED Talks are. It's gonna be there to entertain you, spend your lunch in here. Don't worry, he's not gonna talk as long as me. He's only gonna have five, 10 minutes. And um, I hope I inspire you to be part of this project in the future. And I'm always open anytime to ever talk about getting better at making a compelling story and overcoming the curse of knowledge. Um, and you can shoot me an email if you're interested in that or if you want to just chat. Uh, but that's basically it.